بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم من الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته brothers and sisters and friends and welcome to Sapient Voices where we give platform to voices of wisdom and we facilitate discussion in order for wisdom and reason, sound reason to prevail. With me, I have our beloved Sheikh, Sheikh Yarwar Baik, and I'm going to introduce him before bringing him on board. Sheikh Yarwar Baik is the founder and president of Yarwar Baik and Associates. He is an advisor, author, life coach, and corporate consultant. He is alumni of Hyderabad Public School, Nizam College, and the Indian Institute of Management in Ahmedabad. He draws on his extensive experience of over 35 years in consulting with multinational corporations, government, and business entrepreneurs on three continents. He specializes in leadership development and family business consulting. He is on the consulting faculty of GE Corporate University, Crotonville, AMA International and SVP National Police Academy, Hyderabad, India. Mr. Sheikh Mirza Yarwar Baig is the resident scholar at the Islamic Society of Western Massachusetts and Hampshire Mosque and Hampshire Mosque and the Muslim chaplain at Springfield College and Westwood State University. Sheikh Yawar has a keen interest in education and believes that primary and secondary school education is the foundation for societal change to create a society based on compassion. He is advisor to Jamiat al-Ulama, Council of Muslim Theologians, South Africa, and Sri Lanka, and the Association of Muslim Schools, South Africa. He founded the Mahboob Habib Masjid, an Islamic center in Hyderabad in 2009, and was its imam, in, imam until 2019 when he moved to the United States. Sheikh Yawar has written Fifth, sorry, has written 40 books, including three audiobooks and five books of 52 Juma Khutbas each, and speaks five languages. One of my favorite books of Sheikh Yawar is Leadership Lessons of the Life of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And you can find him at yawarbaig.com. Sheikh, Salaamu Alaikum Rahmatullahi wa Barakatuh. No, the pleasure is all mine. The pleasure is all mine. And after this podcast, I think the pleasure will be all theirs, those who are listening, inshallah. So I'm just going to go straight into it, Sheikh. I want to ask you one important question, which in the context of da'wah, sharing Islam, as you know, Sapiens Institute wants to share Islam academically and intellectually and develop others and empower others to do, to do so the same. So in the context of da'wah, what is the number one missing ingredient? That is a very difficult question because um, I, can, I can probably answer it for myself. Uh, and I would like to answer it for myself, not for everybody else. But I think maybe people can look at that. <clears throat> for me, I think it is to deal with the disappointment that you do not get the kind of support that you want from Muslims for the work of Dawah. Um, I know that everything that we do, we remind ourselves that we are doing it only and only for the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone and for no other reason. But it would be nice if we got the kind of support that uh, would really make things happen and produce results. Now, once again, you know, the, the issue of saying all of these things in an Islamic context is that somebody will say, well, you know, results are in the hands of Allah. Of course they are. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, well, laysa li insan illa masa. So therefore, um, we need to make the effort and in that effort, if we have support, the um, example that I always think to myself is the entire community and brotherhood of the Sahaba with Rasulullah Sallallahu Now, from as a as a Muslim and from a position of aqidah, I will not say Rasulullah Sallallahu could not have or would not have been able to achieve his results without them. But if I look at it from a purely objective way, 
uh, as a leadership consultant, then I must say that the role of the Sahaba and the kind of support they gave him, which was completely unstinting, completely sincere and total and wholehearted. This was a huge element in the success of his dawa, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And I feel that this is a this is the sad thing because, um, as I said, I'm speaking for myself. Uh, for those for whom this is a different reality, all part you. But you do not get the support that you would really like to have, and so uh, you have to keep consoling yourself by saying that Uma Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala only sent me to convey, and I am conveying. Uh, but I would be lying if I told you that results were not important to me. Uh, I would be lying if I told you that I am just satisfied with conveying and it doesn't matter whether anyone accepts it or not. It does matter. Um, and it is uh, it makes the task much more difficult uh, when you do not get the support of your own people and you uh, and your own people disappoint you in that. So uh, you know, and it's not a it's not an either or thing. It's not that nobody supports. Of course, of course, a lot of people do support and so on. Alhamdulillah, uh, and that's uh, also partially what keeps you going. Of course, it is also the uh, you know the the uh, whatever class we we think we have with regard to Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. But definitely, it is also support of people. But one would. At the end of the day, you would say, um, if only this had been more. Okay, so let's unpack that a little bit, Sheikh. So in terms of support, give me some examples. What do you mean? Because I think your experiences, they may be a microcosm, but I think they will represent a macrocosm. I give an example. We had a leadership retreat just a week ago, I believe, called The Visionaries with Sheikh Haytham and others, and it was in collaboration with Sibyl. And one key aspect of that retreat, which, by the way, we referenced your material. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you. And in fact, when Sheikh Fahad Tasneem was delivering a session and he, I think, quoted one of your quotes from your book, I think, if, if I remember correctly, he thought it was very powerful and he was moved. So may Allah bless you, Sheikh. And when we're delivering that retreat, Sheikh Haytham mentioned something about having a world vision, how you see the world. And your personal and organizational vision should be in some way subservient to the global vision. And what happens, unfortunately, in the Dawah today, we conflate the two. We think the organi organizational vision is somewhat the same as the global vision. Yes, it wants to achieve that global vision. But then what happens is they think the organization is, is the only vehicle for that global vision, which is never the, never the case because you don't have all the, in, all the resources at your disposal. And then what happens subconsciously, at least from a collective perspective, you have organizational primacy over the, the primacy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because your global vision must be Allah-centric and akhirah centric And when we have that misalignment of visions, if you like, what happens is we stop helping each other. We think I can do it myself or we have this kind of collective malaise, the collective ego that I can do this myself and it's about me and my organization and we forget the bigger picture. And this really, I already had this in mind, but this awakened to me the importance and the primacy of the fact that we have to support everybody involved in the sector because your success is my success. Their success is my success. It's similar to the hadith of Prophet Al-Mu'minu Miratul Mu'min. The believer is a mirror of another believer. And you could just expand this from a macro point of view. So in that context, Sheikh, and even your bird is agreeing with us, I think, yeah? <laughs> That's a blue jay outside, it's MashaAllah, MashaAllah. See, even, even, even the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is affirming <laughs> what we're saying. So Sheikh, the, the point here is, give me some examples. Let's unpack this a little bit more. What do you mean by support? And what are the reasons why you think the support is, is not there? You know, um, I think I think you put your finger on it, and I think that part of the reason, and I'm now talking about uh, dawa organizations, 
Uh, part of the reason is that Dava organizations have taken their methodology uh, from two sources. One is Christian evangelical, uh, evangelical preachers. And second is from the corporate training world. Uh, motivational speakers, Tom Peters, and, and so on, so on, so on, you know, so training. Now, the corporate training world is my world. So I know what, what happens, I know how it works, and, and what are the foci, and, and so on, so on. The issue is that when you take a tool, the culture of the tool comes with it, right? Technology is uh, not value neutral, and technology is not culture neutral. Technology brings with it the ideology behind that technology. Uh, for example, if you're using artificial intelligence, AI, for uh, one of the primary for, uh, you know, powers of uh, AI is uh, it enables a massive data searches and very um, you know, um, intuitive kind of uh, results and answers. It automatically brings in a thinking and a ideology of the supremacy of technology. Uh, it brings in this belief that technology can solve all problems. Uh, the power of technology. And if you are not careful, then this is juxtaposed against the power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah's khudrat and what Allah can do. And mm. technology becomes more powerful in our minds and our understanding than the khudrat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is something to, to, to keep in mind. Now, what has happened, I think, uh, with the Dawa organizations is that they have used the Christian, uh, Christian uh, evangelical preachers methodology and the methodology of uh, uh, people like Tom Peters, uh, you know, and, and so on, uh, Stephen, Stephen Covey and all that. So they are presenting Islam like uh, motivational courses. Now, Islam, as we know, Rasulullah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent him uh, with a, a four-step process, right? Yatlu alayhim ayatihi wa yuzakkihim wa yu'allimu mul kitab wal hikmah. So, inform them, teach them, recite for them what you, re what you received. Then, prepare them to receive it themselves. Now, yuzakkihim. So, taskiyatul nafs wa tarbiyatul akhlaq. Now, which means that if you simply hear it without being, uh, your, without your uh, heart being uh, ready to receive it, uh, it's, not go it's not going anywhere. Uh, so, that preparation has to be done. And the third one is, wa yu'allimumul kitab. So, teach, teach it to them. And the fourth one is demonstrate how it is to be practiced, which is wal hikmah, the wisdom of it. Now, the example I always give is that of a farmer, that the farmer has this absolutely fabulous seed, which is the most powerful seed, which can give him the best possible harvest. But if the farmer takes this seed and simply scatters it on the ground, the seed will, will die. You know, it's not going to give any results. Any intelligent farmer who knows anything about farming will first prepare, he'll keep the seed safely and then he will prepare the soil, right? He will take away, he, he, will, he, will, he will plow it, he will uh, winnow it, he will do all the stuff with it. Uh, he'll check the pH value, acidity, alkalinity. Uh, he will look at pathogens, soil pathogens. He will work on that, any pests and disease. Uh, all of this he will do. He will dig irrigation channels so that water can get to the seed and so on. Then he will plant the seed. And that seed also, he will plant it in the way that specific seed should be planted. Some seed, seeds have to be scattered. Some ski, seeds have to be planted deep and so on. Right? Um, and after that, he waters the seed. This is the whole process. If the farmer misses any of these steps... Either the seed will die or even if it germinates, uh, it will wither and uh, he will not get a crop. He won't get a harvest. 
the issue with our dawa work is that we do two things and and dawa as well as i i will even include the way we teach islam uh, including in the madaris and the uh, darululums illa mashallah if somebody has a madrasa or darulum or a dawa system which does not uh, is which is not like what i am saying or i'm going to say then all power to you uh, keep on the good work we we do out of the four things we do two and we miss two yatru alayhi ayatihi we focus on the tilawat of the quran so we focus on tajweed we focus on the different styles of recitation and so on and so on and so on yuzakki him preparation we have forgotten we don't even know how to do that anymore illa mashallah we do not even have teachers who know what to do about it anymore how do you pre- how do you pre- purify my heart right i come to you i say I, 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 my, my heart is impure does anyone even know what to do about that if somebody says to you look in your heart what do you see do we understand this do you understand the statement is is it just words look in the heart means what means look in the pocket and remember this is the statement that ibrahim alayhi salam who was at the age of maybe 80 plus 90 said to his little son ismail alayhi salam about whom allah said when he was ready to walk what age is that we are not talking about that he is not talking saying that to a 20 year old or a, or even a 15 year old we are looking at a little boy what did he say to him he said fanzur mada tara look what do you see after telling him that i have seen you i have seen myself sacrificing you to allah subhanahu wa taala in my dream then he says to him fanzur mada tara look what do you see and the son re- responds straight away the son, the son doesn't say what look where what kind of conversation is this i have no clue what you are saying my father No, he knows exactly what his father is saying, because he is connected with his heart. He knows what is the meaning of "look at your heart." So he tells his father. He says, "Insha Allah, wa sabirin, you will find me among the go do." He says, "Do what you have been ordered to do." If al ma tu maru, and you will find me among the insha Allah, because again, see the see the see the awareness. He is not saying I will have sabr. He does not know. I mean, when was the last time his throat was slit? So he doesn't know he will have sabr. He doesn't know that. He said, Insha Allah. So this taskiya be, we have forgotten. We we focus on the recitation. We, even hymns of the Quran, in the big majority part of the world, hafiz do not know what they are reciting. I'll tell you a funny story about that later on. a uh, true story but funny story anyway so they memorize they recite they learn how to do that well beautifully and so on and so on and so on people sit and they admire the recitation oh this is sad al ghamdi oh this is uh, fulan bin fulan the question to ask is what are you admiring the tune then how is that different from admiring bob marley that's also true is that what the quran came for to admire the tune because you don't understand what he's saying you are just looking at the lilt in the voice you know i remember the first time i saw you in that uh, leadership program in uh, in london what was that place Uh, I think it was um I think it was Milton Keynes it was High Wycombe one of those two places High Wycombe High Wycombe right And you walked into the hall when I was reciting something and you pointed at me and you said that is a trained voice And you said I know that because I have a trained voice Right but my point is is the recitation of the Quran only about tra- voice training but that's what we have done so yatru alayhi ayati we focus yuzakim zero work 
Then we look at Yuali Muhammad Kitab. So we focus on starting from calligraphy, beautifully illustrated, beautifully illuminated uh, mushafs. Then we go into teaching it, the tafsir, the tarjuma, the translation, the tafsir, the, uh, the you know, the, the, all of that. Uh, and then we argue about that and we have all kinds of uh, debates and we have all kinds of symposia and everything to do with the ta'aleem of the Qur'an. Without tazkiyah, ta'aleem of the Qur'an. And the last part, which is actual practice, again zero. That is our problem. So now, Dawa organizations also have taken Islam as a product and they sell it out there as a product and they see another Dawa organization in the same way that Coke sees Pepsi as competition which should be destroyed and we must grab market share right that is the problem when Ibrahim alayhi salam was there, there was Lut alayhi salam, who was his, they say he was his nephew, but he was in the same time as Ibrahim alayhi salam. When the Malaika came to Ibrahim alayhi salam and they said that we are on the way to destroy the people of Lut, Ibrahim alayhi salam didn't say, hey, that's what we want. There was my competition. Fantastic, brilliant. He had tears in his eyes. He said, what about Lut? <coughs> right? Now, this is, the, this is our problem. Islam is not a product. I say to people, Islam, you got it free. Keep it free. We have changed Islam into a product. So we run courses. We uh, sell those courses. And some of the stuff, I mean, you know this stuff, but I, some of the stuff I've seen, it is so ultimately so bad, it's not funny. I was in Malaysia, there was one Dawa organization. Malaysia seems to have become the center of, uh, you know, all these Dawa organizations. So I don't know whether all of that stuff is now shifting to Turkey or what. But um, there was one Dawa organization which was, which announced a weekend course on Surat Yusuf. So another Dava organization immediately publishes their entire text course material on Surah Yusuf on the internet free. Until that time it was not free, until that time it was not published. But the moment this Dava organization announces the course, they publish all that inf information free. So it is to say you don't need to go to that course. Here it is free. Now what is that? Another Dhab organization. I was in, I was invited. I was speaking. Beautiful big hall. Absolutely perfect acoustics. Everything. Then they said to me. They gave me the name of a female. A lady. Uh, Alima. Whose session was the next day. And somebody came to me. They showed me the uh, promotional sheet. And they said, Sheikh, please notice. Uh, in the same hall, the front seats are more costly than the seats at the back. So I said, why? They said, because she's a lady. Huh? So I said, tell the lady to put a screen in front of her, to speak from behind the screen, uh, like, like all my tablighi and uh, Devadi brothers do. Then we'll see the fun. I mean, what is this? This is, this is not Dawat al-Islam. This is, this is money making, right? So if you want to do Dawat of islam I would say stick to the methodology of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Four things. Yatlu alayhi mayati, wa yuzakim, wa yuwalimul kitab, wa hikmah. 
it must come through practice it must come through taskya it must come through actually physically uh you know demonstrating it and not demonstrating to show but demonstrating in our own life so which people can see and learn from this is and therefore the point that you made which is there is no competition with another dawa organization that other dawa organization is they are my brothers they are the people we are both in the same work so in the same area now if there are 50 dawa organization which are alhamdulillah we want another 50 we don't say how can they come how can they come? this is our no no this fighting for turf is is really very highly undignified and disgusting i mean i, I do i do um, empathize and understand what you're saying sheikh you know i've been around in this sector for maybe i think over 15 years now and i have seen some of the things that you've mentioned but there are also very good bright stars individually and organizationally that are doing some very good work and one thing i want to zoom in on which i think i agree with mostly is the aspect of tasqutun nafs it is the case from my experience at least where people have a fear and it it may be a, a sincere fear that if they overemphasize on the kind of aspects of tasqutun nafs then the focus of the organization will move away from the important work of doing the action and doing the dawa and it will be focused on let's just focus on ourselves yes one would argue you could do it in parallel but i do kind of see their concern and their fear however moving on in my age now maybe getting a little bit more experienced and actually seeing the dawa in a different way and and managing the art i actually feel that your point about the tasqut and nafs is probably the most important point in our dawa. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in surah Fussilat verse 33 and who is better in speech than the one who calls to Allah does the dawa calls to tawhid does righteous deeds is righteous and says I am one of the muslims. Now sometimes we forget the second and the third piece of advice here we just do the calling but we forget the righteousness and not only that sometimes we get blinded by our own successes and we don't think hold on a second what if i was more connected to allah what if i did the right thing internally and externally maybe i would have had greater success so i shouldn't pat myself on the back and this is why you know what we teach sometimes is when you have success you should not pat yourself on the back you shouldn't have this sense of ujub and self amazement but rather what you should have is you should praise allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you should do istighfar you should repent to allah and you should turn back to him just like what allah advises the prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam when he says about you know when the people are going to enter the religion in crowds and allah tells him how to respond to this success right praise allah yes. do istighfar turn back to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and i think we miss that in the dawa because of our lack of connection and we tap ourselves on the back we've got all of this success but why we never i never hear people say this i'm an honesty chef and it really hurt, it hurts in a way we never ask what if what did i do wrong not withstanding my success not withstanding my success what did i do wrong or not totally correct internally and externally that prevented me from getting even better results and not even not even standing in the possibility that that is a valid question i think that is a sign of our kind of malaise so okay what should people do what should do art to do and organizations do to implement this essential methodology of the prophet sallam which is about tasqut and nafs what should they do in order to ensure that the dawa is successful have a beautiful question <clears throat> what they should do is define success What do you mean by success? Today we are defining success in the same way as Coca-Cola and Pepsi. Head count. How many people came to my course? How many people came to my conference? How many people came to my class? This is not success. So we have to redefine success. What is the meaning of success? Then everything will fall into place. I'll give you an example. We are say, say for example, you are teaching Quran. 
hips, for example, right? Now, what is what is your goal? You say my goal is this kid must memorize the Quran. You say okay, so he memorized the Quran. Um, how about understanding what he is reciting? That's not my goal. Does it make sense? No person will say that, but that's what they're doing. I was in a madrasa in uh, Hyderabad once, and uh, I went into the Darul Tahfiz, the Hibs uh, program, and the Ustad he told me, please come and sit and listen to these uh, these boys. I said so. I went and sat down. Uh, one of those boys came, he sat in front of me. So I said, okay, so recite something. He started reciting Surah Tankabut, and he came to the ayah. Kul siru fil ardi fanzuru kaifa bada al khalq. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Go and tour the earth, travel in the earth, and see how I have created creatures. So I told him to stop. He stopped. Now, where we were sitting, over to the right, through the door, we could see into the yard of the madrasa. And there, were a, there was a bunch of uh, chickens grazing in the yard. So I said to the boy, I said, uh, look at the chickens. What do you understand about the ayah you just recited by looking at the chickens? Now that poor kid, I mean, he, he was like thinking, you know, what is this man? He's mad or something. I mean, but of course, they all have adab, so they don't, they don't tell you, Shaykh, you're crazy. But, you know, he just looked at me like I'm crazy. So I told him, I said, do you understand what you recited? He said, you know, he said, no. So I explained to him, I said, this is what the ayah means. He said, okay. I said, now you understand what it means? He said, yes. I said, now look at the chickens. What do you understand? Again, zero. So I asked him, I said, tell me something. What is that chicken eating? He said, insects and, you know, seeds and grass. I said, what about if there's a little gecko, a little lizard? What will the chicken, he said, chicken will eat it. I said, what happens if you eat the, if, if you eat the lizard? He said, I will die because they are poisonous. I said, what will happen if the chicken eats the lizard and then two hours later, next day or whatever, you catch the chicken, you slaughter the chicken, you cook the chicken and you eat this chicken. What will happen to you? He said, nothing. <clears throat> so I said, something that is poisonous, you, which will kill you if you eat it. The chicken eats it does not die and you eat the chicken and you don't die either. He said, now, I told him, now, look at the ayah. And look at the chickens and tell me what do you think. Now his eyes opened wide, his jaw dropped and he said, subhanallah, he said, I never thought of it like that. I said, of course not. Nobody teaches you like this. This is the problem. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, إِنَّمَا الْمُؤْمِنُونَ الَّذِينَ إِذَا ذُكِرَ اللَّهُ وَجِلَتْ قُلُوبُهُمْ وَإِذَا تُلِيَتْ عَلَيْهِمْ آيَاتِهِ زَادَتُمْ إِمَانَ وَعَلَى رَبِّهِمْ يَتَبَكَّرُونَ Surah Al-Anfal Allah said, only those are the believers who when the word of Allah, when the name of Allah, when Allah is mentioned before them, their hearts shiver with the glory and majesty of Allah. And when the ayat of Allah are recited before them, their iman increases. And they have tawakkul on Allah. They have trust on Allah. Now, tell me, and you can ask this question to people. When was the last time that as a child is sitting with his ustad, memorizing Quran or learning tajweed, that the ustad stopped him and said, you just recited this, what is the state of your heart? Did it have any effect on you? Does this happen? I don't know a single incident that this happens. This is the problem with us, Kya. Now, you asked me, you said if they focus, they are afraid that they focus too much on Tazkiyah, that they will lose the num units and numbers, but this is what I said, lose the numbers and this one. Think about it like this. 
Say, for example, instead of running the Dava organization, you were running a dojo, a karate dojo or an Aikido dojo, right? Now, people are students are coming and they are uh, learning from you. And you also have your assistants. Now, tell me, will you and your assistants do your regular workout every day before those students come or not? Or will you say, it's okay, I know the theory. I can tell them this is how to do, use the katana and this is how, this is how the, you know, one, one blow and this is how you block it and whatnot. It doesn't matter if I don't know how to do it. Your own expertise, your own ability, your own power with the knowledge reflects in your teaching. And that's what is happening right now. That's the reason why we have these numbers. But if you, if you look at the general condition, it is a reflection of us. That's why I tell people Islam is the name of a practice. It is not the name of a theory. A non-practicing Muslim is not a Muslim. Who is a Muslim? The one who practices Islam. Not the one who knows about Islam. Who is a Musalli? The one who prays. Not the one who knows about Salah. Who is the Saim? The one who fasts. Not the one who knows about fasting. Who is the Haji? The one who did Hajj. Not the one who knows all the Arkan of Hajj. So how does it change when we say who is a Muslim? A Muslim is the one who practices Islam. So this is where the importance of Tazkiyah was Tarbiyah. Because from and it's a constant thing. Nobody reaches the point to say, well, no, I am now khalas pure, done. No. Till the last breath in our body, we have to keep on doing Tazkiyah. That's the reason why it is so important to have a Muslim. Is to have somebody who you go to for your own correction. <coughs> yeah, so you sure, know, our, so. our teacher, uh, Imam Abu Hassan, he used to say, I'll say it in Urdu, how you said it, and I'll translate it. He used to say, Agar koi apne aap ko isla se mustasna samachta hai, to wo shaitan ki god me bata hai. He said, If anyone considers himself, Free from the need of Islam, free from the need of being corrected, then that person is sitting in the lap of Shaitan. Yes. Chef, I echo your views. Yes. However, we bring it back to the idea of success because you mentioned in the beginning, you know, we want people to accept our dawa efforts, we want people to listen, we want, in a way, it is a sign of ikhlas that you want the numbers, that you want the success. And then you spoke about, okay, we need to redefine success. And you said it's not just the numbers. It's about, you know, what we want people to become. Like, you know, there's no, you know, we want people to become Muslim, for example, but we want them to become good Muslims. And not only that, we want to please Allah in the process and we want to do it for the sake of Allah. So what I'm gathering from you here is a sign of success is the numbers, but it's not necessarily the fact that just because you have numbers, you have success. Because success is the greatest triumph. And as Allah says in the Quran, the greatest triumph is entering Jannah. And that means you have been enveloped by the boundless mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you did it for the sake of Allah. Whatever you did, you did it for Allah. It's not the amount of deeds, it's the weight of the deeds. Allah weighs your deeds, He doesn't count them necessarily. So I don't want people to be confused here. So I, I do, it, I don't know if I'm summarizing what you're saying accurately. So the numbers are important from the point of view that you want people to accept Islam or you want people to be transformed, for sure. But success is not only intrinsically in these vanity metrics, but rather... You have to understand where are you in that process? Did you do it for the sake of Allah? And are you having an Allah-centric goal? Meaning, do you want Allah's pleasure? Do you want to go to paradise? And are you doing it in the right way? And are you doing it for His pleasure? And are you 
maximizing your success from the point of view that you you don't only want, for example, 10,000 people memorizing the Qur'an, but you want 10,000 people not only to memorize the Qur'an, but to become the Qur'an. As you mentioned very uh, very eloquently, you know, someone who 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 fasts, for example, is is you know, if you know about fasting, it doesn't mean you're you're someone who fasts. It's like being a Muslim. You're in a state of surrender. You're in a state of peaceful surrender to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. It's a way of being, not just a way of knowing. And yes, you have to have knowledge to be. But being is greater than knowing because you can have abstract knowledge and not do anything with it. You can know all of the ayat on dhikr, but never become a person of dhikr. So am I summarizing holistically what you said from beginning to end so far? Yes, you are. Let me clarify a little bit by saying mm -hmm. that I don't see this as numbers versus taskia. No. Okay. I am saying you need taskia to get the numbers. Allah Akbar. This is the method. You will. You think you have numbers, but if you do taskia and if your heart is pure, those numbers will be ten thousand times more. Allahu Akbar. Allah that is the point. That is the link. That's the way to get it. Allah. It's not this or that. Allahu Akbar. Right. That is the point. Okay, Sheikh. So, the next question I have, in the context of the Dawah sector, the Dawah sphere. Can, can I interrupt you? Of course, you can. Yeah. Um, so therefore, to get the numbers, you have to forget about the numbers and focus on the taski. Okay. Right? This is where we are saying, forget the numbers. We are not saying forget the numbers. What? No, we need the numbers. But if you really want the numbers, you got to focus on yourself. Good. Only then will you get the numbers. So forget the numbers to get the numbers. <laughs> sure. And one would argue practically and even from an Islamic perspective, you should do both in parallel. You should do the action and keep on refining the action because only through the action you get ikhlas. You don't just give it up. But at the same time, you have to work on internalizing the deen, being an embodiment of Islam and just trying your best and getting closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and freeing yourself from the spiritual diseases which can prevent your success and the organizational success and the entire ummah's success. So, would you agree that it's a, it's a parallel thing? It's not one or the other? No, not even parallel. The numbers are the result. Leave the result. The result is because of something you are doing. So, focus on that something. And that something is... Your taskia, it is the acquisition of knowledge. It's the preparation of the heart and, and uh, to re receive that knowledge. It is our behavior. It is our akhlaq. All of this will result in the numbers. So forget the numbers. Okay. That's only the result. Refine, sure. Let me refine what I said. I agree with that. What I'm saying is when you're working on something, you're working on yourself. But from a dawah context, you're also working on the action of giving dawah. So I agree. Uh, the numbers will come. As Shwaib alayhi salam says, indeed, my success is only from Allah alone. Success is from Allah. So what we're saying here is we're not making a false dichotomy of focus on the internal, then do the action, the dawah. We're saying doing those things at the same time. And then the numbers will come. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Obviously, action of dawah, I mean, speaking it's is good, part, of the part of the working on yourself. But the reason yeah. it's important because there are some people, I think sometimes maybe they say just focus inside and do the action later. But alhamdulillah, okay, that's clear. So in the context of the Dawa sector, my beloved Sheikh, you write in your book about the need or the necessity or the importance of having an extraordinary lofty goal. Okay. What were you trying to convey and why is it important? You know, uh, again, we go to this motivational speaker's uh, issue. Um, think about this. Somebody is standing at the base camp at the bottom of Mount Everest. Does he need a, does he need a motivational speech? Right? There's no way. He doesn't need it. Why? Because the mountain motivates him. 
even to get to the base camp requires an enormous level of physical fitness. You can't just, you don't go there by helicopter. You, you walk, you trek up. So somebody who went to the base camp is someone who's already spent a couple of years, if not more, preparing himself, getting the level of physical fitness, then all the equipment and whatnot he needs, and now he's standing at the base camp. You don't need to talk to him about motivation. The mountain motivates him. But if you take the same thing, Mount Everest is 8 kilometers long, 8, eight kilometers tall, right? So if I say to you, Sheikh Hamza, I'm going to go out of my house, out of my gate, and I will walk 10 kilometers. So you must give me a medal. And I'm equal to Edmund Hillary, who climbed Mount Everest, because he only walked 8 kilometers on Earth. He wasn't flying, right? He also walked, he walked 8 kilometers on Earth, and, but I walked 10 kilometers also on Earth. But are we the same? No. We're not. Not by a long shot. Why? Because it is not the Earth. It is the gradient. It is the angle of the Earth which counts. So that is the that is the, the thing. Why an extraordinary goal? Because the goal itself motivates. It's the nature of extraordinary goals to inspire extraordinary effort. Nobody rises to low expectations. People rise to high expectations. So that's the uh, that's the reason. That was actually very take powerful. take, take Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You know. As a, as a leadership trainer now, I've been doing this thing now for almost 40 years. The most difficult thing, absolutely without parallel, the most difficult thing is to get people to change their beliefs. You can get people to change attitude. You can get people to change behavior very easily. I have a book called Hiring Winners. It's a book on, on, on uh, behavioral uh, interviewing and so on. So it's a book on hiring. The thing I say there is, hire values, train skills. Never try to train values. You won't succeed. If you want people of high integrity, hire people of high integrity. Don't hire Boris Johnson and expect him to give you high integrity. It's not going to happen. <laughs> Right, the, the, the British people learn that to that to their cost. The the point I'm saying here is that uh, the most difficult thing is to change people's values and to change people's beliefs. That was the goal of Rasulullah Sallam. He was not focused on behavior. Behavior was a result of that. The salah was behavior as a result of changing who you worship. So he didn't call people and say, look, I'm going to train you in Salah. You know, if nothing, it will at least improve your flexibility and it will give you better digestion. No. So the goal is so almost impossible. If you think about this, subhanAllah, what on earth? I mean, Ya Rasulullah, couldn't you think of something easier? No. The goal inspires. The bigger the goal, the bigger the inspiration. SubhanAllah. Jazakallah, Shaykh. And this is uh, interesting because the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he taught us in the Hadith, if you're going to ask for Jannah, then ask for Firdaus, right? The highest uh, level of Jannah. Also, Allah says in the Quran, that, you know, those who just, you know, those who ask for the for the dunya and the akhirah, this is where the, the acceptance or the success lies, right? So this is very important because the Quran and the Sunnah, they, they advocate and they promote and they inspire having this lofty goal. Alhamdulillah. Well, echoing what you said in the beginning, Sheikh, that, you know, people need support. People need community support. They need a team. They need people around them to be successful. And you said that was one of the kind of personal issues that you're facing. So link to this having a lofty goal. We, we know it can't be achieved alone. Look at the best person who walked on this planet, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, from a practical point of view, he didn't do it alone. He had his Sahaba and the Sahaba had the Tabi'een and so on and so forth. So from the, and, and, and we know, you know, 80 years after the greatest calamity that hit this Ummah and the greatest calamity to have hit this Ummah is not the Mongol invasion. It's not the ransacking of Baghdad. It was the death of our beloved Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And 80 years after his death, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we were in Multan in Pakistan and we were in Spain. 
So the achievements were happening after the death of Prophet ﷺ because the lofty goal, you know, a vi lofty vision transcends your lifetime. So obviously such a lofty goal cannot be achieved alone. Whatever lofty goal that we, we select. And obviously the lofty goal has to be Allah-centric and Akhirah-centric, meaning we should want the pleasure of Allah and we should have Allah in mind from the point of view that we're doing it for his sake. So in this context, how does a leader who has, who has, the, who has this lofty goal Develop and motivate a team in order for such a goal to be achieved. Okay. Two things, two words. If I forget, just remind me. One is weighing scale and two is foundation stones. Okay. Weighing okay. scale, foundation um, stones. Okay. Yep. Yeah. I'm linking it back also to what I said with regard to, you know, you said what's the disappointment. I said getting, uh, you know, sufficient support from our own people. Now, I don't know if you've seen this, but um, any of our, um, you know, the, the viewers and listeners, especially in uh, the Indian subcontinent, so India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, and probably the same thing applies uh, in Africa as in uh, and Middle East. If you go to a shop to buy food grains, you know, rice, wheat, barley, maize, whatnot, corn, so say you get you go to the shop and you tell the guy I want uh, 20 kilograms of rice. So you we have these uh, weighing scales, you know the, the the typical scale like two two pans and and a pivot in the middle. So what this guy does is he takes a 20 kilogram weight and he puts it in one pan. So now this pan is sitting on the countertop, the other pan is up in the air. Then he takes a scoop and he takes the grain out of the sack and he pours it into the pan on the top. So this pan is here, he's pouring grain to the top. So now you ask for 20 kilograms, there's a 20 kilogram weight here, and he's pouring it. Now imagine this scene, and I would suggest to people just go and do this, physically see it for yourself. This guy is now put in 5 kilograms. Do you see any change? I mean, this this pan is sitting on the on the on the countertop. This the bar is up. Do you see any change? No. He keeps pouring. Is it maybe he put in ten kilograms? Maybe fifteen kilograms. Is there any change? No. They're still sitting on the on the on the countertop. They're still up in the air. Now, has it ever happened to you that this guy says to you, he says, "Sheikh, you know what? This is not working. Right? This cannot work." Why don't you go to some other shop? There's no way that 20 kilograms is going to happen. Will he do that? He'll never do that. If you said it to him, he'll laugh. What does he do? He continues to put in that rice. Until he comes to 19, maybe 19 and a half kilograms. Now at 19 and a half kilograms, you see there is some movement. This pan which was sitting on the countertop is starting to go up and the other one is starting to come down. The guy now, instead of using a scoop, he uses his hand. He takes the grain in his hand and he releases it a little bit at a time like this until the pans are level. And then he's a smart guy, so he puts in a little more, so you are happy. And he gives you your 20 kilograms of grain. Now, what do you learn from this? What did I learn from this? I learned two inalienable fundamental truths first truth until 19 and a half kilograms nothing will happen second fundamental truth at 20 kilograms the balance will tip both are equally true so if you're doing the work of Dawa and you say, well, I'm working so hard and so on and so on. Like I said, you know, I wish I wish, I wish there was more support. Yes, I agree. I wish there was more support. But have I stopped working because of that? No. Because I'm, I know that I'm still not at 19 and a half. Will I get to 19 and a half before I die? I don't know. Maybe I will, maybe I won't. It doesn't matter because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is watching. So we work with patience and we say, if nothing is happening, guess what? Nothing is supposed to happen. That is how it's supposed to be. But the other truth is equally true. When you get to 20, actually a little bit before 20, 
the balance will tip. No doubt about that. My second word, foundation stones. Supposing you are a rock. Now, there is somebody who is building this iconic, absolutely fabulous structure. Call it what you want. You know, call it a masjid, call it what you want. But some beautiful, fantastic structure. And part of the design is that this structure, the front of it, is going to be sheathed in, uh, in, in, in this marble or granite or something. Now, you are this block of granite. And I am another block of granite. And we've got a whole bunch of blocks of granite. And we say, you know what? I want to be on that front. I want to be on the, I want to be polished and I want to be on the front of this building. The world must see me. So somebody says to you, look, before that building will get to that stage where they start sheathing the front with, with, uh, with granite, there has to be a foundation. You got to dig in the ground and people like you, granites like you have to go in there to be buried, never to be seen again. And unless that happens, there is no building. There will be no structure. There can be no structure. Are you willing to go into the foundation, to be buried, never to be seen again, so that that structure can stand on your shoulders? Nobody will know you're there. Except the constructor, except the contractor who built it. But because you are there, that structure stands. When Musab ibn Umar anhu, at the end of a very short life, got what Shaheed, what got killed in Ahad, what success did he see? Sure, some people accepted Islam at his hands, but within quotes, success and spread of Islam and so on and so forth. When Khubay bin, bin Adi, was being chopped up into pieces and they asked him what does Muhammad mean to you? They didn't actually ask him that question but I'm going to lead into that for some another uh, thing. Incidentally, this is my, this is my hope of the Juma. Um, they asked him how would you like Muhammad وسلم, to be in your place and you go free? What did he say? He said, I would not want even a thorn to prick Muhammad وسلم, and I would and I am free and, and happy with my family. I would not even want that. He said, if my life goes to prevent a thorn from pricking his foot, my life is well spent. So as they chopped him up, he looked up at the heavens and he said, oh Allah, Send my salam to Muhammad Rasulullah. Hey. This is not about standing and seeing Nasheed and saying a salatu wa salam wa ya Rasulullah. No. These are the rocks. These are the rocks on which the structure stands. And there are so many of them. Sumayya bint Khayyat radiallahu anha. What success did she see? She said, La ilaha illallah and she was killed. Her husband, Abu Yasir, Abu Ammar, Yasir Abu Ammar. What success did he see? There's so many of them. But if they had not agreed to be buried in the earth, never to be seen again, there would be no Islam. There would be no structure to stand on them. So today we have all these shiny faces. But the reality is there. <clears throat> this is um, very uh, pertinent, Sheikh, because I think... Many of our du'at 
many of the preachers, many of the scholars who are out there in the world, they have to realize that they're standing on the shoulders of giants. Yes. And not only that, they're standing on the shoulders of people that they don't even know. And they're standing on these foundation stones that only Allah knows and we don't even really know. And I think this is extremely important, especially in our context, because sometimes it's about the speaker, it's, the, it's about the leader, it's about the one in the front. And forget that in actual fact, for all of this even to be possible, fundamentally it's because of Allah, but he has placed certain foundation stones in order for the structure and the building of Dawa to be erected and to stay upright and stable and strong. Allah has placed certain foundation stones and only Allah knows about them and we don't. And sometimes we chase being, you know, we want to be the windows and we want to be the, you know, the, the, what people could see. But fundamentally, one would argue that the foundation stones get the most reward, right? Because they had ikhlas or at least more ikhlas because they're not known. And they were willing to be buried and forgotten. They were willing to be buried and forgotten in order for the Dawah to be successful. And this yeah, is tell you a story. Of course, please. In uh, in India, you would have heard the name of Shah Waliullah Dahlwi. Of course, yes. He wrote the book, now, uh, The Conclusive the Argument from God. Yes, yes, yes. <clears throat> Um, now, one of his sons, now I can't remember exactly if it was Shah Abdul Aziz or one of the others, all of them were great scholars and great Mahadithin. So he had a lecture in the Jami Masjid in Delhi, the Mughal Mosque, the big uh, Shahi Mosque uh, in Delhi. And obviously thousands of people because, you know, he was very well known. And so thousands of people, huge crowd. And obviously those days there were no mics and so on. So they used to have people who communicated. So I, they would listen to him and they would repeat. <coughs> and this happened. So this was after Isha. So by the time the whole lecture finished, maybe hour, hour and a half, uh, it was late in the night. <coughs> So he finished the lecture, he came inside in one of the rooms of the masjid and as he was sitting there and some of his special murids, they were with him, a man came. Now this man was a villager from some village in, in uh, central India, uh, maybe a farmer or something, some poor man. He came and he said, yeah, Sheikh. How unfortunate I am. He said, what happened? He said, you know, I came from my village to listen to you. But I, my village is far away and, you know, transportation and all kinds of stuff. And I got delayed. And now when I get here, I find that your lecture is over. <coughs> your speech is over. Now, what do I do? I, he said, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry for myself that, you know, I, I took all this trouble. I came all this way and now I've lost everything. <clears throat> Obviously, in those days, he couldn't say, no, no, refer to, you know, YouTube channel, so-and-so, or, or here's a cassette. No. So, Shah, Shah Abdul Aziz, Rantula, he said to him, sit down. He sat him down. He stood up. And he delivered his entire lecture of that same one and a half hours to that one villager. Right? Same passion, same dalail, everything. That man was absolutely delighted and he, you know, he kissed his hand, he said, and he blessed him and he gave him a lot of dua and so on and so on and they left. After the man went, his muridin, his uh, disciples, they said to him, they said, Shaykh, this is a very strange thing. Uh, how is it possible that, you know, you gave this lecture to 10,000 people and with all this passion and, and, and you know, all the... The, the evidence and the Quran and hadith and so on. And then this one guy, and who is this one guy? We don't even know who is this guy. Some poor villager from somewhere. It's not as if he's the governor or the king or something. nothing. He's, no, we don't know who he is. We, we'll probably never see him again. And you give the same lecture to that one guy with the same quality. So, how is it possible? 
So Shri Abdullah Abdullah he said to them, he said, you know, you have been with me for so many years and you have wasted your time. He said, looks like you learned nothing. He said, SubhanAllah, Shaykh, why do you say that? He said, because when I was speaking to 10,000 people, I was trying to please one. And when I'm speaking to that one man, I'm trying to please the same one. What difference does it make to me? Whether there are 10,000 or 10 million or one or nobody, what difference does it make to me? That is what I meant by forget the numbers to get the numbers. He got his 10,000. He got his 10,000 because he didn't care about the 10,000. He cared about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, I was many years ago, about uh, almost 20, 25 years ago, I was in a, uh, I went to an ishtava in uh, Los Angeles. So, there I met this Jamaat, which came from, turned out to be a little village between the Afghanistan-Pakistan border. They are what they call the Sarat. These people could barely speak English. So, we were sitting and, you know, drinking some tea and chatting with them. So, I asked them, I said, where are you from and you know which uh, is it a big city and uh, they said because they said a lot of jamaats go from here so i said you know it's a big place and they said no no they said sheikh is one small village so i said then how come all of this they said sheikh it's a strange story they said that one of our village guys he went in jamaat public people came and he went with them he went spent four months or whatever he spent he came back, and when he came back, he did what Tabli people usually do, which is Thursday evening or Wednesday evening, he said, after Salat al-Maghrib, he stood up and said, after Salah, after the Sunnah, uh, we will speak about Iman and Yaqeen. Yeah, sunnah toh ke baad, Iman Yaqeen ki baat hogi. This is a standard phrase. So this man said that the same thing happened, which happens always, which is that even those who normally prayed Sunnah in the Masjid, they left. So there was nobody there. He said, this man, however, did a funny thing. He said, what he did was, you know, in, in our masajid in, uh, in the subcontinent, we have uh, caps. So usually these caps are uh, made of straw or something. They're all stacked up. So anyone comes to pray who, who doesn't have a cap, he will wear this cap because we're very, we're very particular about this praying with, a, with your head covered. So there was this stack of caps. What this man did was, he went and he took a bunch of caps. He arranged those caps in a semicircle on the on the on the carpet of the masjid, on the floor of the masjid in front of him. He stood up and he delivered his bayan, his lecture to those caps. His complete bayan. Then he collected all the caps, put them back, and he came and he prayed to Rakat of Salah and he is weeping before Allah. He said, Ya Allah, see my see my state. I'm talking to caps. They said that this man not only did that one time, he said he continued to do that week after week after week after week. So they said a month passed, two months passed, three months passed, six months passed. He said then talk started in our village. And people said to one another, they said, why are we doing this to him? He is our brother. He is from our village. He is related to us. All the man is saying is, come and talk, listen to the greatness of Allah. I say, what's our problem? Why, why don't we go and listen? And they said to each other, you know, this is very bad. We are, we are, we are at fault. We cannot treat our brother like this. We are insulting him for what? He has not asked us for anything. He said, people started sitting. And that, the rest is history. We focus on the process, not on the result. That's the reason why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala taught us to ask for the process. Ihdina sirat al mustaqim. Allah, guide me to the path. He didn't say, guide me to Jannah. No. Guide me to the path. The benefit of focusing on the process is if you get the process right, the destination, the goal is automatic. And it is automatic in the right way. 
na Islam, in Islam, with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, both the destination and the path, both the goal and the process are important, the means and the ends. In Islam, there is no concept of the uh, end at any means or any or, or, or you know, means right, end is not important. No. Numbers are important, but getting the numbers in the right way is equally important. If you focus only on the numbers, it is possible that you get the way wrong. That you end up getting numbers through means which may be, you know, wrong in, in several ways. But if you focus on the means, you focus on the path, on the sirat, then the numbers will automatically come, the goal will automatically come and they will come in the right way. And you will please Allah. That's the most yes, important thing. Absolutely. Uh -huh. Because the, as we said, success is the greatest, tri the greatest triumph which is going to Jannah. Attaining the pleasure yes. of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So That's why I said, redefine success. How do we define absolutely, success? Absolutely. Don't and define vision, success for a dawa work like the, like Coca-Cola does it or Pepsi does it. Yeah, sure. And our vision must be connected to the Islamic definition of success. Now, coming back to the question, which there, it, I know you went off in a different direction, but I think it's quite connected about how do we develop a team in order to achieve that lofty goal? So what I'm gathering from what you've said so far, it's we need a team that have the right values that follow the correct process in order to achieve that lofty goal. Yeah, absolutely. It is, it is you, you have to get the right people. You recruit the right people. It happens, it happens slowly, it happens over time. But one of the most important things is to focus on what each person brings to the team. And don't, and where there may be a possibility in some cases that uh, you may not even like somebody or it may be some ego issue or some personality problem. One must not allow that to come in the way of getting that person on board. Again, back to Sira. Take somebody like Khalid bin Wali, uh, Amr bin Alas, uh, Abu Sufyan, right? Radhi Allah Anhum. They are not necessarily the nicest of people. They are not necessarily people that Rasul loved from day one. These people were his, were, his, were, his, were his, after his blood. I mean, they were people who were, who were trying to kill him. I mean, the only reason they didn't succeed is because Allah did not allow them to succeed. But when it came to recruiting them on the team, Rasulullah treated them like his dearest and closest friends. Because he saw the value of what Khalid bin Walid could bring to his team. And, you know, as they say, the rest is history. And, and they became his closest companions. They became, they became exactly. Muslim, yeah. They did become. I mean, they, they, they did become. And that's the result. That is the reason of the way he treated them. Yes, because he related and related to them in a way that optimized them. And this is very, it reminds me of uh, the story of Fadala ibn Umair. Now, Fadala ibn Umair was someone who uh, nominally became Muslim, but wanted to kill the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa and he was circumambulating the Kaaba, and I think he was saying something to himself. And the Prophet ﷺ noticed this, and he asked him, you know, what are you saying to yourself? And Fudala ibn Umair basically, I think, just dismissed it. And then the Prophet ﷺ put his hand on Fudala ibn Umair's heart or chest and said, ask Allah to forgive you. Now, Fudala ibn Umair, after he said, after this point, no one was more beloved to me than the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So this is someone who wanted to kill the Prophet sallam, but look at how the Prophet sallam related with his behavior, with his way of being, with his words. He related to people in the right context, in the right way, to optimize them, to get the best version of them. And I call this how you relate is what you create, right? How you no, no, relate is nice. what you create. Just like, for example, Sheikh. The Prophet had hilm, he had a lot of forbearance in the famous story of the Jewish man who came up to him and pulled him by the collar or by the cloth and he left the mark, I believe, and one Sahabi was angry and the Prophet responded with halim, with forbearance. Just like what it says in Surah Fusilat verse 34, good and evil are not the same, repel by that which is better and between two people there's any enmity, it will turn to intimate friendship and this is difficult except for the patient. And this Jewish man, he became Muslim because he was waiting for one more sign of prophethood he saw two signs, he needed one more, and that sign was not repelling by that which is better, essentially. And we know the ulama say repelling by that which is better is repelling by that which is more virtuous and by that which is more beautiful. 
so this is this this is very important. So you're, what you're basically saying is the Prophet ﷺ in his relation to the Sahaba optimized them, but at the same time he selected the right people for the right job, irrespective of anything else, right? And in in our context, when we want to hire people, we shouldn't do it because oh, I like him more, or he plays chess with me on Sundays, or he likes the same coffee as me, or whatever the case may be. But it's because I truly believe that this person has what it takes internally and externally in order to achieve the results. And my affinity towards him, my relation towards him should be irrelevant as much as possible. So this is a very, very good point. So, Sheikh, following on from this, now, this is interesting now. You mentioned in your book putting, putting oneself on the line. In other words, courage, right? And I would argue a lot of academics and intellectuals and even du'at, they lack what I would call a sense of courage. From that perspective, why is courage so important in the da'wah? What does it mean when you put yourself on the line? Okay, a very nice question. Um, by courage, I want to sort of define or broaden the definition. It's not only... Uh, or rather, maybe in, in a modern Dawa context, it might not be related to uh, any physical danger at all in the first place, right? Sure. Um, it's about doing the, but, doing the right thing irrespective of consequences, right? Or saying the right thing. Exactly. And also, courage as in, uh, you know, there may not be any physical consequences, but it's a question of you're doing something and you're not getting uh, not getting success, and you still continue to persevere and so on. So all of this takes a lot of courage. Um, so this courage is, 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 is if, if I take it and, and put it in another context, which is entrepreneurial. Uh, one of the very important things that we uh, look for, um, and and uh, say for example, as, as venture capitalists. Uh, if somebody is come making a pitch to you and asking you to invest, one of the most important things they see is what is the level of your own investment in your in your startup? Because the reality is that only startups in which the promoter uh, has significant investment can go to success. So unless you have put your neck on the on the line, I'm not going to fund you because this is your baby. And if you are not interested enough uh, to literally put your neck on the line, I'm not interested. Right. I'm not sure that my money is in the right place because then you are going to be playing game with my money. I don't want that. Right. I want a return. And my return will come only if your life depends on this thing. So that is the meaning of courage, which is that what is the level of your investment? Um, the, the example you gave of, uh, of warriors and, and uh, people of knowledge, again, it's the, the, the whole issue comes to that. It is not just, you know, uh, blind uh, being combative and so on, which we see quite a lot. I mean, you see people uh, in the name of Dawa, for example, uh, being so uh, combative uh, without any concern for people, you know, literally sort of accosting people in the street and, and uh, and, and talking to them in ways which are, uh, frankly, between, between you and me, they're quite offensive. I mean, if somebody had talked to me like that, I'd be, I would be offended before anything else. Uh, but uh, that's the reason because there is no, there is no, you know, investment in, in your own learning. Uh, so I think that's uh, car courage is very, very important. And courage, in, courage means uh, to continue despite a, uh, despite a lack of visible results. By all means, look at your method. Maybe the re reason for lack of visible results is because the method is not uh, working. But you don't give up. You, 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 make, you, can, you can change the method and make it more compatible and more, more uh, uh, you know, effective. But uh, you continue the effort. And that takes a lot of courage. And would you say courage would be continuing the effort irrespective of praise or dispraise? Absolutely. And irrespective yeah. of maybe the foreseeable or unforeseeable uh, uh, obstacles or consequences, right? Yeah. Um, Absolutely. Now, obviously, there is an element of not being 
foolhardy and using hikmah, doing the right thing in the right way, saying the right thing in the right way at the right time. But irrespective of, of those and considering those things, courage would be saying what you have to say and doing what you have to do irrespective of foreseeable, unforeseeable obstacles or consequences, correct? Absolutely. She's saying what well, how, how do we develop said. courage? How do we this develop is so, courage? so, so critical. Um, a lot of times people don't say what needs to be said because they're looking at the audience. You know, you might be the khatib in a masjid and you've got a bunch of people who are, uh, who have got businesses dealing in haram. Uh, but you don't want to say anything about that because they are the guys paying your salary. You know, some of them, are, some of them are committee members and board members and whatnot. So you don't want to say that interest-based earnings are haram, uh, selling cigarettes and uh, you know, uh, beer and and whatnot, lottery tickets and and pornographic magazines uh, in your 7-Eleven or in your convenience store. Uh, all of this is haram. Uh, you know, you you don't want to say that because you don't want to offend them. That takes courage. There's no physical. I mean, nobody is going to beat you. You probably will not even lose your job. Frankly speaking, that that's more of fear than than anything else. But okay, so you lose your job. But then who is your razak? Is it Allah or is, this be, uh, or is it these people? So it, that takes courage. That, that, that is very important to do that. That's why I, I sometimes tell people, I mean, when I, when I teach, uh, when I do courses on uh, doing the Jummah Khutbah, which, you know, we periodically I do them. I say to people very clearly, if you are afraid to speak the truth on the member, don't climb the member. Do not stand on the member. That member is the member of Rasulullah. It's not yours. When you are standing on the member, you are standing in the possession, in the position of Rasulullah. So don't violate that position. Don't violate the, uh, the, 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 the sanctity of that position. I can understand that there may be a reason why you cannot say what needs to be said because you fear physical danger and so on and so forth. If you say what needs to be said, maybe you will be hauled off to jail or something. Don't say it. I'm, I'm, I'm not suggesting to you that, you know, you must say it. No, don't say it. Praying Juma is fard. Doing the khutbah is not fard. So don't do the khutbah. You go pray Juma. But if you are standing on the member, then say what needs to be said. That is the, uh, that's the, my definition of courage. So how, how do we develop courage, Sheikh? By focusing, ta'alluq ma Allah. By focusing on Allah. We say, Allahu Akbar. What does it mean? The simplest answer to that is that. Focus on Allah. Focus on the Akhirah. I am going to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. No matter what. The greatest coward and the, and the most courageous person are both going to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When we say, La nafi wa la dharra illallah, no one can benefit and no one can harm except Allah, then what, 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 what are we afraid of? SubhanAllah. Yeah. That is the key. The key is, is that in the heart? All of these are words. Very easy. And, you know, in, a, in, a, in our culture, if you say the same thing in Arabic, it somehow sounds more, uh, more superior. <laughs> and people think, oh, mashallah, that's a big alif. So, Sheikh, okay, so I was the IRCO for just under three years. Alhamdulillah, you know, we increased uh, international operations, operations by, I think, over a thousand percent and the funds by over 500 percent. Then I moved over to, over to Sapiens which our vision is a world that receives the message of Islam and where Muslims can share and defend the faith academically and intellectually. And our strategic focus is that we are focused on doing the da'wah, in other words, in our remit, which is sharing and defending Islam academically and intellectually and empowering others to do so as well. In the context of this leadership position that I have, and I'm asking this question for a general answer and a specific answer, because I don't want you to think that you're just talking to me, that you're talking to everybody. In this context, what would be key pieces of advice that someone like myself and or in similar positions need to take very seriously 
in order for us to have success in the DAO? Yes, you've mentioned many things already about Tesco to Nafs. You've mentioned about following the process. You've mentioned about having a lot in mind. You've mentioned about, you know, not chasing the numbers, but, you know, actually doing the right thing and focusing on law and the numbers will come and so on and so forth. But from, a, from, from adding to that, what would you advise someone like myself? And I'm actually asking you know, the that. question quite seriously because I, I, I want to, I, I, I need advice. <laughs> I, I do need yeah. advice. I tell you something, Sheikh. Um, a few days ago, I went through very, I don't know, I don't know what to call it, kind of painful experience. Like, maybe it was like I had a tornado in my mind and a mountain on my back. And... Um, that's a tough experience to have. And I think, you know, in leadership positions or these type of positions, if someone's not in that type of pain, and I think maybe something is wrong <laughs> because it is quite heavy. Um, and I didn't know how to deal with it from the perspective of how do I unpack all of these internal emotions and, and this weight. And I remember prior to that or during that process, a person who is a very, very good brother, he was driving and I was basically ex exclaiming. I was like saying, oh, I was like really perturbed and worried about the state of the Dawa sector. I was really worried about maybe things like conflicts of interest or too much egoism and individualism and so on and so forth. And I was lost in that. Now, usually I'm quite a you know mature, stable guy, generally speaking, but there is a lot of emotions behind the scenes. And as I was expressing this, he mentioned something very profound. He basically said, you've got yourself to worry about. And he doesn't know very good English, right? He said, you've got yourself, <laughs> you've got yourself to worry about. And that just really reframed everything. He made me realize that in reality, you are your greatest enemy. The enemy is the greatest enemy from the point of view of your ego. And... You know, you just need to do the right thing, have ikhlas, focus on your sins, because everything that we see around us could be just a manifestation of our disconnection of, with, with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, that was my state for good or bad reasons. Everything is khair. And, you know, that happens sometimes. And I think that's a natural consequence of being in certain positions. Advise me. Talk to me. Talk to the ummah. Yeah, let me give you a very simple uh, way of looking at this, and it probably applies to not just the Dawa sector or the Dawat, but to practically everyone. And that is the the old statement: "Sharpen your axe or sharpen your saw." Right? Um, remember, the person sharpening the saw or sharpening the axe that is not his goal. If you ask him, what's your goal? He won't say, to sharpen the saw. But unless he sharpens the saw, his goal will never be achieved. Right? So he has to forget the goal and spend time sharpening the saw. And then when he gets on with now sawing the wood or, or cutting those, uh, I, I hate to use terms like cutting trees and so on because you know from a different angle. But purely as an example, I'm saying, Unless he sharpens his saw, now you can take this and apply it to practically anything else in the world and say that unless you focus on that thing, the ultimate goal won't be achieved. But if you ask the person, is this your goal? No, it's not my goal. And which person is going to say, my goal is to sharpen this? No, it's not my goal is not to sharpen this. My goal is to saw that wood. But it, I know that it is not going to happen unless I sharpen the saw. So my goal is to communicate Islam in a powerful, persuasive way to the other person. How is that going to happen? When I focus on myself. I focus on my, myself internally. I also focus on my communication skills. I focus on how I present something. I take feedback. I take, isla, I, I take isla, I take correction. And I continuously improve my way of doing things. Right? So if you say, is, is your goal to 
do all of this. My, no, my goal is to convince people. But I know that unless I present, I do all of this stuff, that goal will not be achieved. That is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said to Rasulullah Kumil Laila illa Kalila. That is not the goal. But unless you do that, unless you charge your phone, you can't talk. It's going to, the battery will die. So that's so, the, the way to differentiate. It, now, if you're, if you're charging the phone, if you're sharpening the axe, it doesn't mean you forgot about your goal. No, no I haven't forgot. I'm really focused on my goal. That's why I'm doing this. So basically, I'm going to bring it personal to myself. The kind of situation that I found myself in maybe a day or a couple of days ago. The key advice here would be sharpen your spiritual axe. Connect with Allah, find out what your shortcomings are, find out what your sins are, find out how you're relating and behaving, fix your frame of reference, your mindset. Are you seeking Allah's help before you seek other people's help? Do you really have tawakkul? Are you enrolling people in your behavior? Are you being that which you want other people to become? Is that what you're trying to say, Chef? Yeah. You know, in one, in one <laughs> small piece, at the end of the longest ayat in the Quran, at the bottom of that page, 15th line, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Ittaqullaha wa yu'allimukumullah. He said, have taqwa of Allah and Allah will teach you. Subhanallah. So have taqwa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is what I need to develop in myself, which is, Am I concerned about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's pleasure? Taqwa is not fear of Allah. This is the other problem with the way we translate. Taqwa is fear of the displeasure of Allah. Fear of displeasing the one I love the most. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, who are the believers? He said, the believers are those who love Allah. Ashaddu hubba lillah. Walladina amanu. Ashaddu hubba lillah. They not only love Allah, they love Allah more than anything and anyone else. So I am concerned and my one and only and fundamental concern is, is Allah pleased with me? And Allah is saying, if you keep that concern, then Allah will teach you. Allah will teach you what you need to say. Allah will teach you what you have to do. And that's the reason why, you know, Allah Mahabal <laughs> said to somebody one day, allegorically speaking, and Subhanallah, I, I, I agree with him and I'm sure you have some experiences like this. He said, why is it difficult to believe in Wahi? He said, even I get it. Now, he's not claiming to be a prophet. He's not saying I'm getting Wahi as in Jibreel talking to me. But he's saying that there are times in my life when I know that I'm saying something that I had never thought of before. Hmm. It's like Ilham. It happened to me. Several instances, several instances in my life where literally I felt uh, uh, like an out-of-body experience. I'm watching myself saying things and I, I know I don't know this. <laughs> I never thought of this. How am I saying this? Where did it come from? This is Ilham. This is Ilham. Subhanallah. I mean, or for example, I want to, I'm writing a khutbah or I want to write a khutbah and that morning I open my email and there is this person who's not even a Muslim who literally sends me practically the whole khutbah. Subhanallah. Yeah, he's talking about whatever I wanted to talk about. He's putting it in. in. No, this is Mr. Allah Ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sense. But the important thing, I, mean, I don't want to give the impression here that I'm a great muttaqi and therefore it's happening to me. No. <laughs> this is just. <laughs> please, I mean, I, I always tell myself, Subhanallah, may Allah protect me from myself. I mean, we, I mean, we really must think and say that, you know, we do things and we must do things in a way, have that. Primary concern is Allah pleased with this, and when we make, despite all this, we make mistakes. Make a step one. Yes, we make mis mistakes. We should seek repent to Allah and turn back to Allah Subhanahu. Yeah, wa yeah. Okay, that is that's reassuring. It's it's reaffirming as well. Jazakallah So, tell me a story. There's a story you told me once, and I almost I think I forgot about it. It was about this slave, this black slave, I think. 
and I want you to tell me this story. This is one of the most amazing stories I have heard from you. And I think people who don't know this story should know this story. It is an awesome story. And I think it summarizes everything that we've said today in some in some way. So, Sheikh, I'm is it all the ears. story of this guy who was praying for rain? That one? Yes, yes, that one. Oh, okay. This is a true story of, of Abdullah bin Mubarak. Uh, he said that he was in Makkah. It was a it was a very very dry drought and you know terrible uh, sort of situation without water. And in the Haram they prayed uh, Salatul Istikha. And Abdullah Mubarak said, "I also prayed there, and uh, nothing happened. Then everyone disappeared, dispersed." Uh, Abdullah bin Mubarak said, I was just sitting there uh, with my back to, you know, one of the columns of the wall. And a, a young man, a black African guy in uh, very sort of tattered clothes, uh, standing near the wall. And he raised his hands and he didn't know Abdullah Mubarak was watching him. So he raised his hands and he said, Ya Allah. People are suffering. They made dua. Nothing happened. He said, Ya Allah, send rain. He said, send rain because I am asking. Okay? And Abdullah Mubarak says that cloud came and it rained. Now, this boy left. And Abdullah Mubarak said, I followed him. And I marked the house that he entered. That house was the house of a slave trader. So Abdullah Mubarak said, next day I went to that house and uh, knocked on the door. The man opened the door and he saw him. Abdullah Mubarak was a very famous uh, alim. They all knew him. He was very happy. He said, SubhanAllah, you came to my house and so on. So Abdullah Mubarak, and, and incidentally, that time, Sufyan al-Thawri, Rahmatullah was staying with Abdullah Mubarak. So they, they were two great scholars. They were in, together in Makkah. So Abdullah Mubarak says that uh, I said to the man, I um, I need a servant. So he said, no problem. I got. So he called the people and, and a whole long line of uh, you know, of slaves. He lined them up and he said, you know, take your pick, whoever you want. Now Abdullah Mubarak looked at all of them. He said, no, none of these. He said, you got somebody else. He said, no. He said, no, no. You have there is somebody else. The man said, there is one boy who is kind of sickly and weak and he's no good. He can't really work, work hard. He's of no use to you. Um, he said, no, I want to see that boy. So they called him and it was the same guy. So Abdullah Mubarak Rahmatullah said, this is the one I want. And a slave trader said, no, please, you know, this guy is good for me. He's Baraka in my house. He said, no, 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 I, I want this guy. So now the slave trader could not refuse him because there's this great uh, sheikh. And uh, so he said, okay, I... Abdullah Mubarak bought this boy and now they are walking on the way to his house. As they were going, this boy was carrying something. It slipped from his hand and fell down. And Abdullah Mubarak, you know, sort of literally sort of he, he ran for this thing and he picked it up and he gave it to him. This boy said to him, my master, this is very inappropriate. I am your slave. Uh, you are picking up my things. Abdullah Mubarak said to him, you are not my slave. I have freed you. Uh, I am your khadim. He said, I took you from there, not because I want you to serve me, but because I want to serve you. This boy stopped. And he said, what did you see? Abdullah Mubarak said, no, nothing. He said, no, 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 no. He said, you saw something. You saw something, that's why you're saying this. What did you see? You have to tell me. What did you see? So when he pushed him and pushed him, and Abdullah Mubarak Rahmatullah said to him, this is what happened. Yesterday we were in the Haram and the Salat is the sky and so on. And I saw you standing there and I saw you making dua and I saw Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent train. And I'm taking you because I were going to my house and Sufyan Suri is there, Rasulullah Ali, and you know, <coughs> we want your company. That's it. You are not there for a servant. 
as a servant, you're not there to serve us. We, I want to serve you. You are my master. I'm not your master. This boy kept silent. They continued to walk. And then they came to a place where there was a small masjid by the side of the road. This boy said to him, to Abdullah Mubarak, he said, My master, can you permit me to pray to Rakat of Salah? So he said, Yes, of course, please go. Abdullah Mubarak Abdullah says, I was standing outside the masjid watching him. He prayed to Rakat of Salah and he raised his hand and he said, Ya Rab, they know me. So call me now. Now, I want to meet you. Call me now. And Abdullah Mubarak Rahmatullah said, he dropped and he died. Allah called him. He said, I don't want to be known. They know me now. So call me. So Allah, may Allah SWT uh, make me more than a storyteller. You know, we tell these stories, well, may Allah make me the one that the story does not become a hujat against me, inshallah. So, Sheikh, Jazakallah for the story, Jazakallah for your insights. Now, I would like to request that you come again in the near future because there's so much more to unpack and we could zoom in on specific topics like vision, strategy, organizational structure. You have a wealth of knowledge from a kind of operational, strategic management point of view and all of these insights would be very valuable, at least in some form for audiences so they could be touched, moved and inspired so they could actually get the best out of themselves and best out of the organizations and their work. So, and I, I really, really want you back on, on, on these issues, inshallah. So, Jazakallah khair. And, you know. Jazakallah khair. This is a pleasure. I mean, it's always a pleasure to meet you. Yeah, and every yeah, time like, we speak, yeah, like every time. We meet in person. It's been too long. I mean, I mean, every time we speak, there's always uh, emotions and tears. So, Sheikh, for me, Jazakallah khair for coming to Sapient Voices and we're definitely going to see you again. And um, I just want to say, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant you and your loved Ameen. ones and your family Ameen. the best in this life and the best in the akhirah. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shower you and your loved ones with his boundless love and mercy. Okay? Ameen. And I mean that from the bottom of my heart. May Allah bless you, Shaykh. Jazakallah for coming. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.